This morning I read from two passages, and I'm going to add another passage this evening as well, uh, also from Ephesians. Um, if you can turn, first of all, to Ephesians chapter 4. There's this, in chapter 4, the Apostle Paul is pleading for uh, unity in the body of Christ and uh, talks about Christ going up into heaven in order that he might give gifts to, to men. And then starting in verse 11, and he gave the apostles, from chapter 4, Ephesians, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, in whom, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Thus far the reading in Ephesians. Now James chapter 1. This morning we looked at verse 1. And now we're going to look at the verses 2 through 4, but I'll read the first eight verses. James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's not a person here that doesn't need you or your illuminating grace this evening. And so we would ask for the Holy Spirit to do what only he can, and that is to open our eyes that we may behold Jesus, who is chief among 10,000 and altogether lovely, would you help us to see him clearly? Would you make him to be exalted in our thinking and our living as we hear your holy word this evening? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Again, our focus this evening will be on the um, verses 2 through 4. My grandchildren reminded me this morning that I forgot to begin my sermon the way I normally do, and that is, dear people of God, called to be saints. So, COVID seemingly came out of nowhere. We know better, but um, it is a trial for our nation. The rioting and the violence caused by Marxist radicals in our nation is another trial. 
And what you do hear a lot of these days are people saying, if only, if only Trump would, if only Cooper would, if only. And perhaps you have thought that way yourself. If only this would happen, if only people would do this. If people would only show more respect, if only people would listen more, if only people would understand their history. And, I, and there are times when we think that way on a more personal level. If only my parents were a little more understanding. If only I had a boyfriend, if only I had a girlfriend, if only I actually were out of high school and into college, if only I had a better job, if only uh, my loans were paid off, if only I didn't have this particular sickness, if only my children behaved better, if only my spouse was more understanding, if only I were not so busy, and you can fill in the blank. You have your own if-onlys. We're all, whether we are young or old, faced with trials of sorts, hardships, one after another. And they just keep on coming. And James gives us guidance as to how to handle that because that is the nature of life in this world in which we live. Now, we saw this morning that we are, like James, slaves of Jesus Christ. He is our God. He is our Lord. He is our Savior. And we are dispersed throughout this world as exiles as sojourners, and we are to serve him. So in the light of what God has done for us in Christ, in light of the good news of the gospel, James is giving us citizens of a new kingdom, members of the church of Jesus Christ, dispersed throughout this world, guidance as to how to live in our kind of a world, skillfully, for God's glory. That's what James is about. And tonight we see that God is at work to grow our faith even when life is hard. We will see the purpose of trials and we will see how to respond to trials. In verse 2, we see those words, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. James has this idea that we're going to meet trials. And you say, well, how does he know? Well, you can see the word there, brothers, which in, means he's one with the people that he's writing to. He, of course, served the church in Jerusalem. And by the time he's writing this, they have faced their share of persecutions and trials. He is also a brother. That means he is one with us in Jesus Christ, who, although Jesus, his brother, was perfect, he was a man of suffering, acquainted with grief. Now, we're not perfect. And we live in a sinful world, and we experience all the consequences of sin. Our own sin and the sin of others. He says, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. And the word he uses for meat, he borrowed from his brother when he told the story of the Good Samaritan. As the 
Samaritan is walking along, Jesus says, he fell among robbers, or robbers fell upon him. It's the same word. As we go through life, trials just seem to fall on us, or we just seem to fall on them. That is, they just come out of nowhere. All of a sudden, robbers were around them. A virus. <laughs> we were in Uganda when the virus, we first heard about the virus. You hear about a case in the United States, and hmm, thankfully we got across the border before it got closed. But a virus seems to come out of nowhere, and society shuts down. The world, in many ways, shuts down. Or maybe you get sick. You leave on a trip, and you have car troubles. As children, you can get a new toy, and you're all excited to play with it, but before you get a chance, your siblings come along and grab it, and they're going to look at it first. You want to play sports, and you have an injury. A storm comes in, and the roof gets blown off your house. Or worse, a letter shows up from the IRS and you're getting audited. You're driving, blissfully minding your own business, and a trooper stops you. You're feeling fine, you go for an annual physical, and the doctor tells you you have a rather serious health problem. You come home from school, and your parents tell you, uh, we're moving. You've got to say goodbye to your friends. We're going someplace else. I've had that a number of times. These are things we face. There are trials of various kinds, big and small, all across the spectrum, and each one of them tests our love our patience, our faith in Jesus Christ. Sometimes trials haven't even come yet and we're anxious about them. We don't know. Something's coming. <laughs> we just know it's coming. We don't know where it's going to come from. We don't know what impact it's going to have, and we're anxious. That's life in a fallen world. Um, and that's for unbelievers, by the way. That's not just for believers. That's for every human being. It's reality. But it is particularly reality for those of us who confess Jesus Christ. Because, as servants of Christ, we are not allowed to respond to trials the same way everybody else does. With our gut instinct, with our emotions out there, you'd say, venting. And so he gives a perspective, a theological perspective about the purpose for these trials that enables us to go through them with a different attitude. Uniquely from unbelievers. In such a way that people will wonder about you. And the peace that you have. A peace that passes understanding. Look at verses 3 and 4. We'll come back to 2. Verse 3 and 4, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Steadfastness. Some translations may have perseverance, but this idea, it's a, it's a, it's a marvelous word, and it means patiently enduring 
whatever comes without allowing what comes to sway you one way or the other from your confidence in him whom you serve and in what he is doing in this world. The testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and you must allow steadfastness to have its full effect so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. When trials come, God has a purpose in them. Whatever the trial may be, God has a purpose. And the purpose is, you could say, well, it's our sanctification. It's our purification. It's to grow us, to grow our faith, if you want to put it that way, to strengthen our faith. Trials produce this patient endurance. Trials produce a mature faith. Now, understand, you have to ask yourself, what is faith? And, of course, for that, we go to Hebrews 11, and we read, faith is being sure of what you hope for, certain of what you do not see. And what James is saying here is that the only way to be sure and certain of what you don't see and of what you hope for, the only way to be sure and certain about Jesus enthroned in glory, bringing all things into submission, is to be tested in your faith here in this world that you can see. You see what James is doing. The God who gives you faith, it's a gift. He gives it to you. He's going to strengthen it. He's doing that through trials. He's going to strengthen that conviction in what you do not see. going to be tested in life. He promised that. There will be trials. You know, all too often, we go through life by what we can see, what we can feel, or hear, or taste. by our senses. It's the way we live. By nature, we tend to go by gut instinct. Through trials, our convictions about what we cannot see about Jesus Christ enthroned in glory, about his coming kingdom. It's tested. And they will be found either to be true or not. Faith is essential. And when we face trials, there are two options. To be crushed by them or to see your faith grow by them. And that's really how James lays it out for us. We live in a world where you see people and they face trials and they just quit. They just shut down. They can't go on. There's some people, they face trials and they finally just give in to depression. Others respond with anger. They blow their temper. They get mad. 
I've seen people on TV, and you've probably seen them too, after a violent storm. And they're screaming at God. But why? Well, how? He could do this. That's the way some people are. They, they get mad. Some people get mad at God. Other people can even take their anger out on other people. They can swear. They can curse. They can yell. They can scream. You find some people, trials come along at work, wherever it is, and they're just complaining, and they're just miserable, and nothing's going good, and everything's wrong with everybody else, and they're just complainers. They're just always moaning. They're always pointing out things in a woe is me kind of a way. And then you get other people, a trial comes along, and it's like, what trial? <laughs> no, don't worry. It's all going to pan out in the end. They just, they just ignore it. That kind of optimi optimism is totally unrealistic. And none of those kind of approaches help us mature. They're cop-outs. None, none of those approaches help us grow up in Christ or in our relationship to our fellow Christians. As believers, you see, we understand something. That God is sovereign. Forgive me if I make reference to the Heidelberg Catechism. But he upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures. In fact, all things come not by chance but from his fatherly hand. In such a way, and think about this, that not a star falls in the sky or a hair from your head apart from his sovereign will. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is reigning? Do you believe that in Christ, by his word and spirit, God is working all things for the good of those who love him. Do you believe that from before, before the foundation of the world, through this day, until the end of time, that there is a purpose in God's plan? And that purpose is to develop for himself a people who are mature and strong and who are equipped for glory. They become increasingly Christ-like. That's why I read from Ephesians 4. That's not only God's plan for us as individuals. His plan is that we as one body grow up through trials to be image bearer together of Christ. When I read it, you maybe noticed, but the language is always we. It's not just the individual. Salvation is for the church. Christ is working in all things, sharpening our faith so that we become a people who remain steadfast, calm, at peace, with one direction in life, seeking his glory. Verse 4, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. That's the echo of Ephesians 4. As James says in chapter 3, verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. All of us do. God has dispersed us throughout this world with a goal in mind. He is accomplishing his good purposes. He is bringing us all somewhere. God is a kind and a gracious God, and he wants us to grow up in him, in a relationship with him. He wants us together to grow up, to, to reach a maturity of faith 
and the church to be the perfect reflection of Christ. He wants us to become fully Christ-like through our trials. Do you ever feel that as you go through a trial, <laughs> you fail in your witness? You ever feel people are going to see me and they're going to see my weaknesses and I'm not going to be a good witness? Well, they will see your weaknesses. There is no ifs, ands, or buts about that one. But God's purpose in these hard times is to shape us to be more like Jesus. That's his goal for us as individuals and for us as a church. That, again, is what Ephesians teaches, that all together we're going to attain to the full stature of the fullness of Christ. That's why he puts us together in one body, of course, so that we can assist one another through trials to this end. We'll come back to that in the end, but think about this for, the, for now. Every time something difficult happens in our lives, every time, it is directing us to Jesus Christ. We are being pointed to him so that we might be more like him. Now think about this. When you have a difficulty in your life, and you are looking for advice, do you go to somebody who's had absolutely no experience? Right? You're an older person. And so you go to the younger people to get advice as to how to handle your difficulties. Is that what you do? No, we tend to go to people who've gone through some difficult times. You find the person who's got a few scars, a few limps, because you know that person has been there and has done that. But not only do you go to a person who has a few scars, but you, you go to a person who with those scars is still remain with his, remaining with his face toward Jesus Christ. That's the kind of person you go to for advice. In fact, go to Jesus. <laughs> because he's really the one who's been there. You see, that kind of a person is Jesus. Trials point us to him. That's the reality and the purpose of trials. We sang it earlier. God moves in a mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea, and he rides upon the storm. He's coming to us in the difficulties. And again, we will come back to this later on. Um, we all want to have... Um, a life in which we are a witness for God. That's what we're called to do. And um, th that witness, we want to be there in good times and in bad times. And so James gives this very strange command in verse 2, count it all joy, brothers, when you face trials of many kinds. And you might say, yeah, pastor, easy for you to say. You're always in your study every day. There is nobody that prays to God in the morning, Lord, send me the hardest day you possibly can so I can be happy. Nobody does that. Nobody says, I'm so happy I'm depressed. Nobody says, boy, I'm glad my children are so whiny today so I can be happy and count it all joy. 
Nobody says that. And that is not what James is suggesting. What he is suggesting, well, first of all, what the world does, they think that joy and happiness comes by avoiding trials. You don't want to go through trials. The point of life living is to be happy. It's to be at peace. The point of life is to be content. And sometimes as Christians, we can buy into that. But think about it. If the goal of our life is ease, it's comfort, then trials are bad. You don't want them because your ease is gone. <laughs> if you're living, if your purpose in living is to be comfortable, to be healthy, and to be wealthy, trials are bad. But if the goal of our life is to be like Jesus, to be Christ-like in this world, witnesses for him, then trials are good. If we have the right goal, then we can, in the midst of trial, be joyful. In fact, we will be because God is treating us as sons. And he's shaping and he's molding us to be like Jesus. You see, if you have the right goal, trials bring joy. Consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kind. We're not told to rejoice because of our trials. We're told to rejoice whenever we face trials of many kind. We are to rejoice in trials, during trials. And um, in um, our Psalter hymnal, we have a little bit of a different version than the the Trinity Psalter. And uh, I want to read this. We have the song, Fill thou my life, O Lord my God, in every part with praise. And that's the desire of every Christian. That no matter what we do, no matter where we go, we're praising God and we are a witness to his glory. And sometimes that happens when you don't even say a word because people can see the conduct of your life. But it has it this way. Praise in the common words I speak, life's common looks and tones, in fellowship enjoyed at home with my beloved ones. Enduring wrong, reproach or law with sweet and steadfast will, forgiving freely those who hate, returning good for ill. So shall each fear, each fret, each care be turned into a song, and every winding of the way the echo shall prolong. So shall no part of day or night from sacredness be free, but all my life in every step be fellowship with thee. Trials bring joy. Lead us into the character of Christ and enable us to be a witness. This idea to rejoice in... Uh, trials. Paul says something similar to the church at Thessalonica, and he says in chapter 5, give thanks in all circumstances, in all circumstances, not for, in all circumstances. In Romans 5, verse 3, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Same theme. 1 Peter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer in grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. And Jesus says concerning trials that come from persecution. Matthew 5 says, blessed are you when people insult you, 
persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Welcome to the church. <laughs> this is the life of a believer in this world. We know that the early Christians offer us an example to follow. Hard as it is to imagine, but they did rejoice in times of beating and persecution. The first time the apostles were beaten, we read in Acts 5, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Paul and Silas were in prison in the night singing psalms. And later Paul could actually say about himself, now I rejoice in what I suffered for you. Colossians 1, 24. They're not rejoicing because of their split open backs. They're not rejoicing because they were in such pain. Because they were. But they are rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering for the Lord. Or you could even say, with the Lord. Because they were Christian. And that in the midst of their suffering, they could reflect him. They knew that what they were going through, through that... God was at work in the world for his glory. So they rejoiced. So whenever you find yourself facing trial, count it all joy, or Calvin would say, be of good cheer. And by the way, that's not a piece of advice. That is a command. You can do it too. Joy in trial comes from the correct understanding, from the theological, if I may say, understanding of knowing who God is and what he is up to. Joy depends on your perspective. Joy in difficult circumstances, joy when life falls apart, does not come from within us. Joy begins with realizing that God is sovereign over all things and that the trials that come our way have a purpose. They come to us under the sovereign hand of a God who loves us, that nothing gets through those nail-pierced hands except what he allows and that he designs to discipline us, to shape us, to mold us, to be like him. And that's beautiful. And there is joy. See, joy depends on your perspective, not the circumstances of your life. Joy comes from your perspective. And that perspective is, look to Jesus enthroned in glory. So what do we do with all this? Since you know who's sending the trials and why, it makes all the difference, doesn't it? James is not saying to the Christians who are dispersed throughout the world in a world in which they do not feel at home, he's not saying, uh, chin up, guys, chin up, be positive, put a smile on your face, Make it look good. No. He knows the reality of trials. And he's saying to them, we are called to shape our thinking differently than everybody else. We are called to renew our minds. We are called to be radically different. He says, you look to God who calls you to believe 
his redemptive work. Joy and Jesus are inseparable when life is hard. Now think about this. I said we'd come back to this. Was there anybody in life who had trials like Jesus? No. Not even Job. And he had a lot of trials. Jesus is the only one who's undergone the trial, the ultimate test of faith when his father, who he loves perfectly forever, turns away from him on the cross and is silent. Hebrews 12 says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross and scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's our perspective in trials. Jesus is the only one who has endured that trial so that we never have to. See, he's been there. He's been there. We have a God, we have a Lord and a Savior. You can say who's walked in our shoes before we did. He was well acquainted with sufferings and grief. And we are called to be like him and to follow him in this sinful world. Therefore, we are called to be joyful when trials befall us. Knowing that through trusting in Jesus and keeping our eyes focused on him, we are being shaped, developed into image bearers, witnesses of our Savior. Keep looking to Jesus. And you say, now, how, how do I do that? And I've made a, uh, another sermon on this, but um, I'm not going to preach that now. Uh, but you go to James chapter 1, and the next verse says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. You want joy? You need this perspective? Ask God. Ask. And it will be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be open to you. Ask without doubting that God, who gave his only begotten Son and because of the cross exalted him to glory, will not along with him graciously give us all things. Ask in faith, not wavering, but confident. You put your trust in Jesus Christ and you never doubt that he will accomplish what he endured. What he began, he will complete. I don't know where you are all at tonight. I don't know what trials you are facing But consider this, God is at work in you, and he is shaping you, and he is molding you to be like him, to enjoy fellowship with him. He's shaping you as servants for his glory. The Apostle Paul, in 2 Corinthians 4, says, therefore, we do not lose heart. 
Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. So don't look at the outward. Look at the inward. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, and what is unseen is eternal. And if any of you are here tonight who does not believe in Jesus Christ and that he was victorious over cross and is enthroned in the glory in glory if you do not believe that and if you do not believe that he is making all things new and he is ushering in the new heavens and the new earth and i would say you have to lift your eyes to jesus christ and do so prayerfully asking for wisdom that you may see and you may in the midst of our trying times have comfort and joy but not only for these times but forever amen, amen. let us pray father thank you for your word and help us to understand what we've heard help us to put it into practice and may we be those who live out of what we've heard. Lord, for all who are facing trials that we cannot even imagine, would you enable them to see that you are all and enough? Reveal yourself to them that they may see your glory. And may we all find among your people a warm acceptance and support in the midst of our trials in the body of Christ. May we all find the head of Jesus Christ walking with us through our trials. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As a song of response,